We had a very robust uh, discussion uh, this morning about a variety of issues that are in front of us uh, as a country and, of course, throughout the world with an emphasis and focus uh, on the fact that we are going to move H.R. 4, the John Robert Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act, today as part of the effort to make sure we push back against the intense voter suppression uh, that we've seen take shape all across America and protect our democracy, not for Democrats or Republicans or independents, for Americans, because free and fair elections are central uh, to our liberty. Uh, and we will channel that in the spirit of the great John Lewis uh, when we move H.R. 4 shortly this afternoon. And hopefully there will be some uh, Republicans who will join us. That remains to be seen. We also, of course, are continuing to move forward to advance President Biden's agenda on behalf of working families, the middle class, everyone who aspires to be part of the middle class, the poor, the sick, the afflicted, the least, the lost, and the left behind, young people, seniors, veterans, everyday Americans. President Biden appropriately said we were going to build back better. We cannot go back to pre-pandemic normal because prior to the pandemic, we know that approximately half of the American people reported that they couldn't afford a sudden unexpected $400 expense. This is in the wealthiest country in the history of the world. That's unacceptable. We are not going back to that. We're going to build back better. And part of that agenda involves the bipartisan infrastructure bill, which we're going to advance. And part of that is going to be the Build Back Better Act that involves jobs and tax cuts and lower expenses for families, children, and everyday Americans. And we're committed to getting that done. Let me yield to our distinguished vice chair. And let me also mention uh, that we're joined today by the three distinguished uh, co-chairs of the National Security Task Force. They'll all be introduced in short order. We're thankful for their presence, for their life experiences, for the service that they've already given to the nation before they were all sworn in on January 3rd of 2019, and certainly thankful for the benefit of their presence, their wisdom, and their work in the Congress. Today, I yield to our Vice Chair, Pete Aguilar. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. And as the Chairman mentioned, we came back from our district work period where we continued to see the transformational benefits of House Democrats and President Biden's policies having a positive effect on people in our communities. By passing a generational tax cut for middle class and working families, we're seeing substantial drops in child poverty, but we're seeing Americans hold on to more of their hard-earned dollars. I was pleased over the work period, just like many of my colleagues, to see $21 billion in rental assistance go out into our communities. Uh, and our goal has been to help alleviate the COVID-19 crisis. And it has always been to keep our communities safe and strong and help them make ends meet. But we're seeing policies that we have passed here make a real difference on the ground. And as the chairman mentioned, will address the landmark reconciliation package, the historic infrastructure agreement, and the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. These pieces of legislation all represent continued progress and a commitment for delivering results for the American public. With that, like the chairman, I want to thank my colleagues for their service to our country before they were elected to office and introduce uh, um, a colleague. Uh, who is a co-chair of the National Security Task Force, Representative Jason Crow. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair Aguilar, uh, Chairman Jeffries, and to my fellow uh, co-chairs of the National Security Task Force of the Democratic Caucus, Andy Kim and Mikey Sherrill. I'm Jason Crow. I represent the 6th Congressional District of Colorado. I also serve on the House Intelligence Committee and Armed Services Committee. Uh, but before that, before being a member of Congress, uh, I was an Army Ranger, uh, served three combat tours in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, two of those tours were in Afghanistan. Uh, and like many of my veterans, uh, fellow combat veterans, 
uh, left a, a piece of my heart in that country. Uh, and it has been a very challenging uh, 10 days uh, to look at uh, what has happened uh, and to um, come to terms with what has been a 20-year challenge. I want to be very clear about something here. Uh, this is not a one-week discussion. This is not a one-month discussion. It is not a one-year discussion. This is a 20-year discussion. This has been a war that has uh, been passed between four different administrations, many, many different Congresses, uh, and we need to have the broad conversation that's necessary for our country, for the American people, as to how we got to this point over the last 20 years and how we do better uh, for the American people. I also want to express my appreciation to the veterans. Uh, I've been talking to a lot of my fellow veterans over the last two weeks, and I'm going to be very clear to my fellow vet veterans. Be very proud of your service. Be proud of raising your right hand and answering the call to service after 9-11 and standing in the breach, because we are proud of you. That service was right and it was honorable, and that's different from the policies and the politics of this war. We will have the debate in this Congress as to what we can do better. But to my fellow veterans, be proud of what you've done and for serving with your fellow brothers and sisters and for serving this country, and we will always be proud of you. So where are we today? Uh, obviously, we're in a very challenging situation in Kabul. There's no secret to that. Uh, it is my personal view and the view of many of my colleagues uh, that we must do everything necessary to save all American citizens and to evacuate our Afghan partners and our allies. This Congress, this caucus, the Democratic caucus, led the effort over the last couple of months to expand the special immigrant visa program, to expedite that program, and we passed that on a broadly bipartisan basis just a few weeks ago. Now we have a moral obligation to make sure we are standing by our Afghan partners and our allies, protecting American citizens, and that moral obligation does not have a deadline. We must do everything necessary, regardless of the deadline at the end of the month. We must extend that and get the mission done. The deadline is when the mission is accomplished and we bring our people home, full stop. Uh, and with that, it is my honor uh, to uh, introduce a friend, but also a fellow co-chair of the National Security Caucus, Mikey Sherrill from New Jersey. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman, Vice Chair, and other members of the National Security Task Force. I want to thank my colleagues here this afternoon for offering their perspective, some of it firsthand, as you heard, from serving on the ground in Afghanistan. The critical mission now is getting all American citizens, our Afghan allies in the SIV program and their families, to safety, as well as additional vulnerable Afghans like women and girls who served in leadership roles. This is, of course, of particular concern to me because we, America, supported their efforts to access education and leadership roles throughout Afghanistan, and they're now in danger as a result of taking on those roles. So our focus needs to be on executing this mission. Everything else is a distraction. And from the reports we've seen and heard, the several thousand soldiers and Marines currently on the ground in Kabul are executing it well with compassion, care, and efficiency, and I want to commend our military members. Make no mistake, this evacuation is an extremely dangerous mission, and it's set to get more dangerous in the coming days. In that vein, there has been significant progress. Approximately 21,600 people were evacuated from Kabul yesterday. In the last 10 days, our forces have evacuated roughly 58,000 and 700 people in 10 days. That alone speaks to the dedication, professionalism, and sheer hard work of our military, our State Department officials, and the IC. So there are indications that we're moving in the right direction as far as accomplishing our mission to get out Americans, our allies, and vulnerable Afghans. That said, I think it is critically important we ensure our military has the tools it needs to complete the mission. I do not believe that this can be accomplished by August 31st, and I've requested that the SECDEF and SEC State encourage the President in the strongest possible terms to reconsider that deadline. I know everyone standing here has stories 
from their districts, much like the ones I'm hearing, hundreds of requests for help. From the currently serving Air Force service member who has family still in Afghanistan, to the pleas for help from representatives of FIRST, an international robotics club, for our aid in evacuating an Afghan, Afghan girls robotics club. And I want to take a moment to say a particular thanks to my friend Jason Crow for his leadership. He's been leading the charge on this effort to ensure we stand by our allies from the start, and I'm proud to stand alongside him in this effort. I also want to thank our troops who are executing this mission under unprecedented circumstances. You're doing a tough job, but I want you to know you are making all of us proud. I also want to thank our military personnel here at home who are working hard to provide safe housing for our Afghan partners when they make it here to the U.S., including personnel from Joint Base mcguire dix Lakehurst in my home state of New Jersey. I want you to know we appreciate your efforts. And I want to end by saying to my fellow veterans as a member of Congress from a district where many of my towns have steel beams from the towers to commemorate those who died in 9-11. Your service in uniform, whether in Afghanistan or elsewhere, around the globe is a thing of honor, a thing of distinction, and of pride. Nothing about the policy debates of the past, present, or future diminish in any way your service and the difference each and every one of you has made to the lives and safety of Americans here at home for the last 20 years. So thank you. And with that, I'll yield to my good friend from the New Jersey delegation, Representative Andy Kim. Thanks, Mikey. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining up here. Uh, a little over a week ago, my office uh, put forward a, a, an email address for those that are trying to uh, evacuate out from Afghanistan. Uh, to be able to reach out to and that we would do everything we can to try to help out. Uh, at this point, just a, a few days later, our office alone has received over 6,000 requests. Uh, many of these requests are from families uh, with multiple people seeking support. Uh, at this time, we have been able to help a number of people, but there is still an overwhelming number of people that have not been helped. And I think that this uh, experience has really shown me just how much more work we has to happen for us to be able to meet our mission for us to be able to do what is responsible for us to accomplish uh, it has been uh, one of the most difficult weeks of my life working through this situation to be on the phone with so many of uh, our partners out there in afghanistan many of them just outside the gates uh, begging me begging people to try to get them to safety and to get through the chaos there uh, from our experience, that problem at the airport gates is the number one backlog and bottleneck in terms of getting at least the people that we're in touch with to safety. And this is something that I've certainly been urging the administration to try to alleviate, find some way to smooth that system through. I have certainly recognized the significant numbers that have been evacuated, but again, uh, just the cries from help are ones that we cannot ignore this effort is one that has certainly led me to believe that, that the mission is not something that we can accomplish by the end of this month. And I strongly, urgently urge the president to reconsider uh, his uh, continued uh, aim towards August 31st to be able to get uh, our mission done. We will not be able to get our mission done by that time uh, based off of what I've seen and based off of what we've experienced so far. That being said, uh, you know, there is a considerable threat to our service members, and that is something that certainly I, uh, as a member of the Armed Services Committee with many of my colleagues here, uh, we certainly hold up at the utmost concern and certainly something that we want to continue uh, to do everything we can to make sure that we can alleviate. Uh, I'd like to just end by uh, talking about how this is becoming a very uh, uh, personal issue and on just a very local front as uh, the joint base in my district, mcguire dix Lakehurst, is now one of the handful that will be receiving uh, Afghan refugees and, and migrants uh, just within the, the coming hours and days. Uh, we welcome them, and I hope America welcomes them. I hope that we recognize that, that we are a nation that is made stronger by our compassion, by our empathy, and our ability to recognize that we can be a home for those that are continuing to suffer. My community will do our part, and I'm very proud that our community in Burlington County and Ocean County will be generous, will be compassionate, 
and I urge Americans all over the country to recognize that this is a moment for us to step up as a nation. We've seen it with that C-17. Many of you probably saw that image of that C-17 that took off from Kabul with over 800 people in it. That is a flight crew and an aircraft that is based in my district. So we are doing our part, and we're urging everyone around this country to do your part. And with that, I think we will do our best to be able to accomplish a mission and be able to try to be able to get all American citizens as well as our partners to safety. So thank you so very much, and we'll open it up. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Mikey. Thank you, Jason. Questions? So the, the administration has, uh, has emphasized that as of now they are sticking to the deadline, but they have, they have expressed some willingness to reconsider based off of uh, situations on the ground. Um, I, for one, believe that the situation on the ground currently already demands that we move past that deadline, and I hope the uh, administration comes to that same conclusion. Uh, but they have expressed that, yes, things are very fluid on the ground. And the number one mission I think we can all agree upon is on the safe uh, evacuation of every single American that we uh, that wants to leave. And, and certainly I think that would be one of the biggest factors if that were to slip or if that was not able to be accomplished by the end of the month. I would assume that that would be one of the biggest factors, if not the biggest one, to have the administration reconsider. I, for one, believe that we should have them reconsider even for our Afghan partners. And I think that that's a tall enough responsibility. Uh, for us to be able to do so. So, uh, you know, uh, we're certainly going to be able to continue to push them in, on all those fronts. Jason and Mikey, did you want to add? Okay. Yeah, the only thing I would add is just my understanding that, you know, the military is doing what the military always does, and that is uh, perform contingency planning for all possible scenarios, including a presence beyond August 31st. Uh, I think that process is, is ongoing. Uh, in addition to that, the State Department continues to, in, to engage with the Taliban in discussions about an extension of that deadline. Uh, I don't think that uh, our presence beyond August 31st should be contingent on agreement with the Taliban, but it's obvious that an agreement uh, with the Taliban would be preferred and would reduce uh, the risks, uh, and, and we should continue to try to uh, achieve that. Uh, finally, I would say is, um, uh, you know, the president has a very complicated and, and a very challenging uh, set of decisions to make, uh, and he has to balance a number of different uh, competing requirements, and one of those is operational security considerations. Uh, so I, I wouldn't expect, nor would I ask necessarily for our intentions or a decision to be forecast uh, in advance of August 31st. Our message is very simple, that we think that that should happen, that there is very broad and deep bipartisan support within the United States Congress which is reflective of the broad and deep bipartisan support across the United States of America, that we believe overwhelmingly the United States Congress and the American people would be behind a decision uh, and would support the decision and are asking the president to make that decision. But of course, the, the time and manner within which he makes that decision has to be weighed against uh, the various operational concerns. Yeah, I, so I don't uh, discuss classified briefings, uh, and I don't talk about you know what I heard and what I said. Um, so I will just talk about on that topic yeah. what I've been pressing publicly uh, and what I've asked for. And, and uh, yes, I have been working with a coalition, a Democratic and Republican coalition, in Congress to uh, expand the SIV uh, program and to expedite that program. And part of that is the increase of the cap. Three weeks ago, we increased the cap from 11,000 to 19,000, almost doubled that. Uh, now we're in discussions, bipartisan discussions, about an additional cap increase, because obviously the demand has greatly increased in the last 10 days for that program. Uh, so we are trying to get an answer from the U.S. State Department as to the current pipeline so that we can have bipartisan discussions in the House 
about what a cap increase w would need to be. And I have not yet received that answer from the State Department. Okay, so how high would this, like, what, what, what would the number for the cap be that would be satisfactory? I don't, I don't, I'm not sure I understand the question. What, how high would you like the cap to go? Uh, I'd like the cap to go as high as is necessary to get people that assisted the United States mission and protected American men and women uh, to safety. We need to get that information from the State Department as to how many eligible Afghans uh, are uh, asking for evacuation and asking to participate in that program. Uh, that is not my guess. Uh, that is, uh, nor is that what I want or don't want. There is an objective answer to that, and that is the number of Afghans who are eligible and have raised their hand and asked for participation in the program. That's the number we're trying to get. I'm very confident. I know uh, Steny Hoyer will likely have more to say about this uh, momentarily, but from the very beginning, there was never a disagreement about substance. Uh, within the family, sometimes there are disagreements about approach, uh, and we've worked through uh, the differing opinions over the last uh, few hours. And I think at the end of the day, the most important thing is that as Democrats, we remain united behind the objectives that have been set by President Biden uh, to get things done in a manner that provide direct relief and assistance to families and children and everyday Americans. We're proud of the work that we've accomplished together already with the American Rescue Plan, but we also recognize as a caucus, progressives, new Dems, moderate centrists, blue dogs, uh, that there's much more work that needs to be done. Democracy is messy, and Democrats are not a cult, we're a coalition. And when you're a coalition of progressives and new Dems and blue dogs, of people on the left and on the center left and in the center, of the Congressional Black Caucus and the Congressional Hispanic Caucus and the Asian and Pacific Islander Caucus and the Women's Caucus and the Equality Caucus, we're proud of the fact that we actually reflect the gorgeous mosaic of the American people in every possible way, including life experience, which is reflected by these brilliant, courageous co-chairs of the National Security Task Force. When you have a coalition as opposed to a cult, you work through issues, but you do it as a family. That's what we've always done. That's what we'll continue to do. Go back to this side. I'm going to give Pete this question, by the way. <laughs> is this a productive way to get things done in the House? And what does this do to the trust deficit that does exist between your progressives and your centrists? The House Democratic Caucus is a family. We are a big family. We are a diverse family. At times, we're a very enthusiastic family. But that is the House of Representatives. That's the brilliance of the House. The framers said, we should be the institution that is closest to the people. That's why we have two-year terms as opposed to the four-year term of the presidency, the six-year term in the Senate, the life tenure of Supreme Court justices, closest to the people. And in the words of the framers, their words, not mine, to reflect the passions of the people. So I embrace the fact that we're a passionate caucus, but a passionate caucus that at the end of the day gets Things done for the people. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I'll go oh, back, back left. Thanks. Yeah, I, I don't buy for one minute this idea that we can't conduct oversight and push to do right by our Afghan partners and our allies uh, and American citizens, and we can't legislate in other things. 
I, 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 had, I did three combat rotations uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan. And while I was doing those combat rotations, budgets were passed. Uh, the, the business of Congress proceeded uh, because we're the United States of America and we can do more than one thing at once. So we're going to build back better. We're going to address the coronavirus. We're going to pass an infrastructure bill. We're going to put a coalition together. And at the same time, we're going to stand up and we're going to say we're going to get American citizens out and we're going to stand by our Afghan partners because that's our moral obligation. Uh, and this is not a binary uh, choice. This is not a, a false choice. So any suggestion to the contrary is just politicizing a very dangerous and risky situation. And now is not the time for politics when we have our men and women on the ground doing extremely dangerous work. Well, Mikey? Yeah, let me let Mikey respond first. I just want to add to that. Um, as a mother of four kids, uh, many of us are looking at sending our children back to school, uh, making sure they're prepared for that. We've got to address that. Many uh, employers in our districts are complaining about workforce shortages. Um, we can't get much of our workforce back if they don't have child care and if they aren't able to get their kids in school. Um, we have severe infrastructure problems across the nation that we are addressing, such as the Gateway Tunnel Project in my district. Um, we have got to address the affordability issue as people try to make a comeback as we're building back better um, to address things like the state and local tax deduction cap. Um, we have a plethora of issues. We certainly can't ignore, as you heard, um, what's going on in Afghanistan. We are very focused on that. All three of us sit on the House Armed Services Committee. We will be addressing that. Um, and we we just all, as, as members of Congress, sat down today to hear the latest update in our briefing. Um, but to somehow suggest that the needs of the nation, especially a nation that is trying to work very hard to make a great economic recovery and a nation that is now being um, hit by another wave of the Delta variant, um, as again, we are trying to make sure our kids can thrive in this environment to suggest that somehow we not focus on the needs of the American people at this time um, certainly doesn't make sense to me. Uh, my response is simple. Kevin, who? Next. Well, we'll take one step at a time, but I think as the speaker has uh, clearly laid out, she envisions a process where all of the committee chairs of jurisdiction, of which there are many, more than a dozen, uh, will be involved in the writing of the Build Back Better Act with the input of their committee members and the input of the entirety of the House Democratic Caucus. And so we look forward to that process. It'll take place over uh, the next several weeks. And then I expect uh, when we come back during the week of September 20th, we'll have some clarity uh, as to where we're at. And of course, uh, it's also a bicameral process and we'll have to work with our, our Senate colleagues. But the most important thing is that we're going to take a step forward today on infrastructure and on the Build Back Better Act. Yeah, that, 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 that's a question for, uh, for the speaker as well as the committee chairs. Thanks. Do you have concerns about the time crunch coming back on the 20th, given everything that has to be accomplished, crafting reconciliation, now this bipartisan vote, funding the government, raising the debt ceiling? Like, do you have concerns about that? I, I, I don't. And it's been extraordinary what we've been able to accomplish, and I want to get Pete in, uh, so I'll yield to him. But when you think about what we've been able to to do over the last two and a half years together and what the class of 2008, this class of majority makers, you know, have been through, uh, nothing is beyond the bounds or out of reach in terms of accomplishment. They came in, we all dealt with it, our majority in the middle of the longest government shutdown in American history. We had to deal with the Trump presidency its toxic nature, an impeachment investigation, an actual impeachment, a near war in 
Iran, a once in a century COVID-19 pandemic, so much pain, suffering and death, a related economic crisis, a presidential election, a refusal to concede, a violent insurrection, another impeachment. And through all of that, you're talking about getting things done like the U.S.-Mexico-Canada trade agreement, ending surprise billing, providing paid family leave for military families and all governmental employees, restoring Pell Grants as part of the effort uh, to deal with the mass incarceration epidemic that we have, the CARES Act, the HEROES Act, the American Rescue Plan, massive tax cuts for families and children. And those are just the highlights. In the midst of perhaps one of the most turbulent periods in American history. So this is a battle-tested group, uh, and I'm confident that there's no challenge that we can't overcome. Pete. We're not afraid of those benchmarks we're not afraid to have conversations about governing that's exactly what the chairman's talking about and what uh, my colleagues behind me and what the house democratic caucus is prepared to do we're prepared to lead we're prepared to govern uh, we're prepared to meet those benchmarks reconciliation gives tasks to the committee chairs um, the chairman and I are responsible to make sure that the caucus has a safe space to have those conversations, those family conversations about building coalitions uh, and getting to the right uh, policy proposals, which in this case includes delivering on the Build Back Better agenda. So that's exactly what we're going to do. And over the next four weeks, uh, we're not going to just go back to our districts uh, and talk about uh, affordable housing and, and rental relief and job creation. We're going to go back to our districts and talk about all of those things and the president's agenda, as well as having conversations with each other on how we craft the next steps. Uh, and there's committee work weeks uh, where I uh, presume that the chairs will roll out a schedule where their committees will be tasked with developing the proposals by which the budget resolution that is adopted today gives them instructions uh, on what to meet. So those are the benchmarks that we're concerned about, as well as uh, what you mentioned, government funding, debt limit, all of those pieces. Last question. Since you are clearly able to multitask um, and work on several different things, why not hold hearings now on Afghanistan instead of waiting until the mission is complete, especially because this crisis in our, is ongoing, evacuations are going on, to be able to call for changes if they need to be made, or are you 100% Well, I'll, I'll defer to my colleagues, but I think that from the hearing standpoint, I expect, and many of the committee chairs have indicated, uh, Chairman Meeks uh, and Chairman Smith in particular, that at the appropriate time, they'll hold hearings, uh, hearings that will be done in a bipartisan way as part of our oversight responsibilities. Uh, and as you've heard today, uh, we, we are not uh, reluctant to push the administration in a direction that we think makes sense for everyday Americans. We're a coalition, not a cult. We didn't see that level of accountability and discussion for the good of America from the other side. Uh, but you will continue to see it from us. And I think that the competence uh, and the sense of urgency of the administration is now on full display in terms of the vastly increased and expedited effort uh, to evacuate Americans, uh, as well as our allies and those women and children who may be vulnerable. More work needs to be done in that regard, as has been discussed, uh, but I remain confident in the administration's ability to do it. I would just add to that. Um, right now, there is an ongoing mission to evacuate Afghanistan. It's quickly moving. Um, the situation on the ground is moving very, very quickly. Quite frankly, even having, um, you know, calling in, and, and we're discussing this right now with, uh, for example, in House Armed Services, we'll be continuing to discuss it with SECDEF, Chairman Milley, to understand better the on the ground situation. But, but we really do critically, especially in the next 
um, several days need our efforts to be focused on that evacuation mission. I can't stress enough, it is going to get very, very dangerous. It's, it's quite dangerous there now, but this is a very complicated mission, especially if we do go past the August 31st deadline. So there is an incredible amount of work. People are working around the clock um, handling the situation, and that's what we want them to be focused on. And to also give you a sense of what else is going on, September 1st, we're all back for the National Defense Authorization Act. So our military's needs and, and the future missions of our military don't end with simply evacuating Afghanistan. Um, we're critically focused on where we need to go in the future, how we modernize, and what the future might look like and how we do that better. That said, again, I think what you heard from the chairman and what you've heard from us is this is something that we will do. I, I went to the Naval Academy and I was studying Civil War battle tactics and after action reports. As the military, we we do deep, deep after action reports. And I was in the Navy. I mean, you know, so so think about that. We will go through the after action report. This will be something that we get to the bottom of what we need to do and how we can do it better in the future. But right now, the focus truly is on this evacuation, which is an incredibly complicated probably the most complicated mass evacuation of people that the U.S. has ever accomplished. Yeah, I would just reiterate what, what Mikey just said, that uh, our obligations to conduct oversight uh, and to have a broader discussion are different uh, when there's an ongoing emergency and contingency operation that requires the attention of the Secretary of Defense, the Chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff, and others. Uh, we uh, don't want, and I don't want them to spend an entire week on Capitol Hill talking to us. I want them to protect our troops, to get folks out, uh, and to accomplish this mission. Uh, they uh, met their obligations today to come and brief us and to answer our questions, uh, and those obligations will be different when the, the emergency operation and contingency operation is over. Um, I'll just, one quick add here is that um, uh, from my experience here on the Hill so far, as well as having worked in the executive branch before during crisis situations, oversight doesn't just happen in the form of hearings. Uh, I'm in constant touch uh, multiple times a day with the administration at different levels at the White House, State Department, DOD, and others. So through those types of means, we're continuing to have that kind of constant oversight uh, that we will, at, at the appropriate time, have the kind of hearings there. Uh, but I just don't want that to be the only metric by which we demonstrate our engagement and our abilities to have oversight. Thank you, everyone.